Hey everyone, exciting announcement here from the Blockworks Podcast Network. We are hiring two podcast hosts to build a show with us called Lightspeed. The TLDR of Lightspeed is that it is a show for builders, tinkerers, and lovers of technology. It's a callback to the heyday of Silicon Valley where great tech was built in garages, not in corporate fortresses, and was truly the Wild West. Lightspeed is an exploration of crypto from the perspective of a builder and an engineer who's designing for scale and is interested in onboarding the next billion users into crypto. If this show sounds exciting to you, you have a background in podcast hosting or content creation, go to the careers page of BlockWorks. That's blockworks.co slash careers. I've also linked it in the show notes here. You can just click there. It'll take you right to the page. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm Mike Ippolito underscore. You can just slide right into my DMs and we'll set up some time to talk. Would love to hear from you. We are super, super excited about this show. So please apply. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I'm joined by repeat guest David Rosenberg, who is, of course, the founder of Rosenberg Research. David, welcome back to the show. Thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. Um, so we talked about this last time, and uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you again, maybe we can pick out one of the, uh, I just love your background so much. You're a learned man, so many books in the background. So I'm going to ask you. Uh, I, I, read, I, I read the last chapter, at least half of them. So uh, <laughs> just, just get to the punchline. That's good. We can skip right to the end. It's what everyone wants. It's the good part. Um, David, you, you've, uh, I, I'd love to start a little bit high level before you, before we dig into some of the weeds, uh, which I'm sure that we'll get into. But can you kind of just start by giving us your 10,000 foot kind of macro view, and then we can drill down a little bit from there. Right. Well, look, I think that um, we are in a, we have been in a transition phase and remain in the transition phase from the uh, expansion uh, that was fueled principally by uh, the reopening trade, but also the massive policy stimulus uh, back in 2021. Uh, that was a gift that kept on giving. Um, but I think that uh the market signals and the economic signals, the leading indicators are all telling me that we're in the final stage of this transition phase, this purgatory, basically, the economy has been in for the past year from making the classic transition from expansion to recession, uh, which I think is actually starting uh, this quarter. Uh, so I would just say that uh, there's a lot of naysayers out there. Uh, I think you and I were having this conversation how some things in the economy have held in rather well. Yeah. Uh, and some have held in better than others. Uh, but I would only say to the people out there that say no recession, uh, there's people out there that say that there's not even going to be a landing. There'll be no landing. The economy will just miraculously just reaccelerate. Um, but if you believe in the no landing and you believe in the soft landing and you think that we're not going to have a recession and a recession is not some dirty word, uh, it's just part of the uh, natural course of events. As far as the economy is concerned, every recession uh, was connected to an expansion and every expansion was connected to a recession. I just find that uh, people get so emotional and passionate about this, but it's just mm. really just part of the cycle. Um, so, look, either you believe in the business cycle or you don't. Uh, I don't think that uh, I frankly don't think that uh, COVID uh, uh, repealed the business cycle. Sorry to say that. Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, I think interest rates do matter. A lot of people think that inter interest rates don't matter uh, in a in a credit driven economy like the United States. How do interest rates not matter? Interest rates always matter. The business cycle is not repealed any more than Mother Nature has been repealed. Uh, and uh, on top of that, uh, what people aren't paying attention to is that there are lags uh, between monetary policy which has the most pervasive influence on the economic outlook. Not fiscal policy, not stimulus checks, uh, not regulatory policy, uh, not tariff policy, trade policy. Fed policy has by far the most powerful, what economists would call explanatory variable uh, in the equation when it comes to economic growth. Uh, the question is, you know, how long are the lags? And in some cycles, the lags between the Fed and the real economy could be two to four quarters. In other cycles, it's four to eight quarters. Uh, these lags uh, are long and variable, uh, which means that there is a, a wide standard deviation uh, between what the Fed does in time A and the peak impact uh, on economic growth in time Z. Uh, and you're quite right, because we're having this conversation 
off camera that the lags this time around, because of all the fiscal stimulus that still produced this, uh, uh, this, this environment of uh, excess savings on household balance sheets to put to work in the economy, it's given this, uh, it was like the, the Energizer bunny. It gave us a little bit more juice. But to say that we're not going to have a recession because of lagged impacts of uh, fiscal stimulus from two years ago, to me, is ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's bought us a little bit more time. That much is true. Uh, but the leading indicators are telling me that the recession is actually starting this quarter. Uh, so we'll see. If it's not this quarter, I think it's next quarter. It's certainly not a 2024 story. The lags aren't that long. But the power of interest rates, it's, uh, you know, the best economist of all time was a physicist named Albert Einstein, who famously said that the power of compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, so uh, let's not forget that interest rates matter and they hit the economy, uh, debt servicing capacity, uh, credit markets uh, with lags. Lags are longer this time, uh, but they're starting to hit home uh, uh, this, this year and I think this quarter in particular. Mm. You know, it's 2023, David, because a belief in the power of interest rates and that the business cycle still exists is a bold, even contrarian take uh, nowadays. And I, I want to get into, you, you know, you referred to a couple of the leading indicators that you look at, and I want to get into what exactly those are. But even before we get there, you know, I think the term the business cycle kind of gets thrown around a lot. Could you just even for the benefit of listeners, could you just define almost, you know, pretend this is an economics 101 class. Could you sort of define what the business cycle is and kind of lay out the component parts and phases that you would expect if you were, you know, just from a very typical business cycle. And then maybe we can, as we, you know, progress throughout this conversation, sort of map some of the phenomenon that you've been paying attention to and writing about to this framework. All right. Well, well, look, all these, uh, we're just talking about cycles here and we're talking about um, there's the economic cycle. Uh, there's the rate cycle. There's the market cycle. They are basically sine waves, these centrifugal forces over time that intersect with each other. And they peak a trough uh, at different times. Mm. So, uh, you know, so the classic, say, early cycle. Early cycle would have been, say, you know, in, uh, in April, May, June of 2020. Or early cycle would have been, you know, July, August, September of uh, 2000. And uh, nine, it would have been, you know, in the first half of 2003. Uh, that's really when you're coming off the recession. Uh, the lagged impact, because the policies always have lags in both directions. You're starting to see all the impact of all the easing by the Fed kick in to economic growth. You hit bottom and then you start to uh, accelerate. Uh, and that's the phase of the business cycle where you have positive growth, but not just positive growth. Uh, but the second derivative is also accelerating. So you don't just have positive growth, but you have accelerating positive growth. Uh, and that's the real uh, sweet spot where things are getting going. And it's usually not fast enough to create inflation. That comes later as you absorb all the excess capacity left behind from the prior recessionary condition. Uh, then what happens is the Fed sees, OK, we got ripping growth. Uh, and so we have to start raising interest rates. And you're still in a positive cycle, you know, that would have been, you know, uh, 2022, it would have been, uh, you know, 2000 and, uh, and, and five, 2004, it would have been, uh, you know, 1998, 99. So the Fed is starting to raise interest rates. Uh, they're flattening the yield curve, not averting the yield curve, but they're trying to basically moderate the growth to prevent inflationary pressures and prevent demand from going much above supply. Uh, for an extended period of time. So the Fed is always basically being a risk manager. Uh, and at this point of the cycle, and this is already a few years after we had the initial rush off the recession, uh, the Fed's raising rates, uh, they're flattening the yield curve uh, to moderate growth, not create a recession. And then you get into phase three, where the Fed inverts the yield curve, where basically uh, growth is too strong, inflationary pressures are burgeoning, and this is where the Fed really starts to raise interest rates dramatically and they invert the yield curve. And that's when you get into the third stage of the business cycle, which is the real latter stage. That's when you're into the seventh, eighth, ninth inning. The Fed inverts the yield curve. GDP growth uh, now starts to slow. So it's positive, but the second derivative is now going down. So it's positive, but slower growth. And then when you get into the recession, it's really 
after that seventh, eighth, ninth inning. I guess they're going to extra innings using baseball parlance. But then what happens is that all the lags from everything the Fed has done to basically slow down, slow down the economy uh, morphs its way into an actual recession or GDP contraction. Now, I'm trying to say here that there is uh, n- not 100% chance that the Fed creates the conditions for a recession. Um, but the historical record shows that we have had 14 Fed rate hiking cycles since 1950, and 11 landed the economy in recession. So I was saying at the time when the Fed started to raise rates in March of 2022, you know, uh, we're on a slippery slope. We're, we're going to be, so I was trying to take a look at stuff a year and two down the road. How are things going to look? Because there's no doubt that when the Fed first starts to raise interest rates, uh, the economy is accelerating. Uh, and we had that phase back in, say, early 2022. The Fed is raising rates. The economy is doing just fine. But I was saying, hey, look, I don't know who out there, you know, goes to the uh, to the uh, racing tracks and bets on horses. But, you know, anybody who does that and uh, does it successfully uh, always plays the probabilities. They play the odds. Uh, you look at the jockey, you look at the horse, you look at the track, you look at the weather conditions. And so... Mm-hmm. Is it just pure happenstance that uh, 80% of the time when we've had a recession, it followed a Fed tightening cycle? Uh, Mm. And there's 20% of the time when that doesn't happen. And we have what's called a soft landing, which is the Fed extending the cycle. Uh, uh, We don't have a recession. We have slower growth, but they don't contract the economy. And it's got to be understood that a recession is a very big call uh, because it is actually a haircut uh, to national income. It's as if the whole country takes an it takes a pay cut. That is that, that's what a recession. It's not that we take the Lamborghini from eighty down to twenty. It's that we go in a reverse, and it's a completely different animal uh, for the economy, for confidence, uh, and for the markets. That's why recessions uh, are a big deal. Uh, soft economic growth, that's fine. Uh, recessions are completely different. Uh, we had those conditions in the mid nineteen sixties. The Fed actually engineered a soft landing. Uh, no recession, and we actually extended the cycle back then another four years, uh, and the same thing for the bull market and equities. Uh, but back then, we had massive fiscal stimulus that offset the monetary restraint by McChesney Martin. Uh, we had LBJ's guns and butter policy. Great, nice antidote from fiscal stimulus. Well, that's not going to happen this time, certainly not from Kevin McCarthy. Uh, mm-hmm. Right now, we're, we're fighting uh, a budget ceiling fiasco. Uh, then we had the mid 1980s uh, under Paul Volcker. Uh, Volcker raised rates aggressively, heading into 1984, 85, and then next thing you know, uh, we have uh, a soft landing, uh, even with the the last vestige of uh, Paul Volcker's uh, tightening phase. And that's uh, because oil prices came down 70 percent, and back then the U.S. was a net oil importer, and uh, that was a de facto tax cut uh, for Consumerica. Um, and then, of course, we had the greatest soft landing of all time that put Alan Greenspan in the history books as the maestro, uh, you know, in 1994-95. You double the funds rate from 3 to 6%. Uh, soft landing, no recession. A lot of people thought there'd be a recession, but you see something got in the way, which was Netscape going public in the summer of 95 and ushering in the internet mania and another five years of uh, massive wealth creation and uh and uh, elongated productivity cycle. So if you tell me what's the offset this time around, uh, there's always possibility that we get an antidote from what the Fed has already done. But the other thing I want to point out here, which comes down to your question about leading indicators, that the one thing the Fed didn't do in the mid-60s, and the one thing the Fed did not do in the mid-80s, and the one thing that the Fed did not do in the mid-90s when they embarked on those tightening cycles that did not generate a recession, was they did not invert the yield curve. They did not invert the yield curve. So not only did we not have, not only did we have a very positive uh, shock from somewhere, whether it was the internet or fiscal policy or oil price decline, uh, the Fed knew when to stop. Mm. This Fed didn't know when to stop. They kept on tightening into the inverted yield curve starting last summer. And if you ask me, if I was alone on a desert island, and a lot of people wish I was, uh, and I was asked what my favorite leading indicator is my favorite tool it is the yield curve it is the yield curve 
the maligned yield curve. I said, you know, and I said last summer, I said, just watch when the yield curve inverts, which it did starting in July. I said, just watch every Tom, Dick and Harry Wall Street economist is going to come out and say, dismiss the yield curve. It's a relic of the past. And it's hilarious because, of course, these same people, when the Fed's cutting interest rates and steepening the yield curve, these same people are saying, watch the yield curve. Look how steep it is. You got to go bullish on growth and bullish on the markets because they get paid to do that. Uh, but oh, 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 when the curve inverts and the Fed's tightening, oh, the yield curve is a useless indicator. And I actually, my best prediction of the year was I was saying people were going to be talking about that the yield curve is no longer an effective leading indicator. Uh, I had some competitors of mine, I'm going to remain nameless. They were quoted at the Investor Business Daily today talking about that the yield curve is a useless indicator now. It's, it can't be relied on. It's got nearly a perfect track record. The only time the yield curve inverted where we didn't have a recession was in 1998 when the treasury market rallied into the inversion. The Fed wasn't tightening, and that was because of the massive flight to safety coming out of long-term capital and the last leg of the Asian crisis. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that as a price signal, as a leading indicator, uh, the yield curve still dominates. And it's not just the twos tens or three months tens. I mean, here you had the first person to say, ignore the yield curve was who? It was Jay Powell uh, <laughs> a year ago where he says, oh no, we've devised a new yield curve out of uh, research at the Fed that it's not twos tens or three months tens. No, 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 no. It's uh, we're looking at the three month, uh, three month forwards, 18 months out. Uh, and it wasn't, it was, it was steep back then. So it was convenient to say that's the curve we're looking at because it wasn't pointing to recession. And now that the own Powell's own yield curve, which nobody ever asked him about. I, I'm there begging. I'm in front of the television set when he's after the meetings, when he's at the, at the podium, somebody please ask him about his own yield curve. Nobody ever does. It's pointing in the same direction. But what we look at, we look at um, the uh, duration of the yield curve inversion uh, and it's now basically 10 months. We look at the extent of the inversion and the peak inversion was over 100 basis points. And I'm looking at twos tens uh, because I find that's the one that's worked the best uh, along with three month tenure. But we also look at the dispersion. We have uh, we have a model in house at Rosenberg Research. We have 21 different yield curves. And when you get over 80 percent of those curves inverted, which we do, uh, that's a bona fide recession signal. So we look we look at the three D's. We look at the duration. Uh, we look at the depth and we look at the dispersion and they're all pointing in the same direction. Uh, and actually, if you look at the yield curve in conjunction with what we talked about earlier, how the business cycle shifts uh, over time. And I talked about those different sine waves, the, the cycles, the, the, the rate cycle, the market cycle, the business cycle. Uh, the yield curve has its thumbprints on how all those are moving simultaneously. And right now, right, and right now, and right now, the lag. Right now, when you're taking a look at the timing of the inversion, and the timing of the peak inversion, it's telling us that if the recession is in this quarter, it's no later than next quarter. So either way, there's no get out of jail free card. The recession is either here or it's staring us in the face in the third quarter. Mm. I, I, you know, I, I completely tend to agree with you, David. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the twos and tens doesn't, it has a near perfect record, but I think the three month tenure has a perfect record for predicting recessions and we, and that curve's inverted as well. So I, I, I tend to be in complete agreement with you there. And it was interesting to hear Chair Powell during the last FOMC compare, you know, the, the yield curve obviously makes it a famously difficult environment for banks. You know, we haven't even talked about the stress in the U.S. banking system. We had a couple of very high profile bank failures, including one large one, not in the U.S. banking system, but over in Europe with Credit Suisse. And he compared the stress in the banking system to an additional rate hike, essentially. So before we get into some of those leading indicators, which I still want to touch on with you, you know, is your is your sort of thought here that the Fed has made a policy error, that the yield curve or a whole bunch of different signals were flashing warning signs to the Fed and they ignored it, maybe because of Powell's concern about his legacy, maybe because of concern that they were too easy on the uh, that they were too easy with their monetary policy for too long. But is your is your position that they sort of messed up and made a policy error here, and has basically made a recession that was probably inevitable deeper than it needed to be? Well, look, they've uh, they made several missteps, uh, and here I'm playing Monday morning quarterback. Hmm. Um, you know, it, it, I guess that 
we can all debate what transitory means. I don't know if 18 months of inflation in the uh, annals of economic history that might still be that might still be uh, transitory. But I don't think anybody. Uh, I don't even think even Larry Summers thought we we're going to get even for a month nine percent inflation. Yeah. Uh, so you know things went pretty crazy, and uh, I think the first mistake was in the context of the fact that the economy had already reopened. Remember the vaccines. I mean, Pfizer Monday was November of uh, of twenty twenty, uh, and here we are after Trump's round of stimulus checks before. He went off into the sunset uh, and now about to return. Uh, we had Biden's budget buster in March. Insane, insane fiscal stimulus. Uh, and, and not the stuff that's a new deal, uh, not infrastructure, just stimulus checks. Uh, and the Fed accommodated it. Uh, and sorry, just, just uh, David, just for, for listeners, FDR, yeah. that was FDR's new deal back in the 1940s, which was largely... Uh, an, in, an investment in infrastructure of the nation. Yeah, it was in the right. it was in the 30s. Yeah, but everything 30s. that you can see today, the Hoover Dam, you know, right. a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the canals, uh, Mount Rushmore, a lot of the bridges that were built uh, was part of the that was infrastructure. That was actually fiscal stimulus that had a, a, like a, an IRR attached to it. It generated uh, a rate of return for the economy. This was just right. like funny money, get people money to spend. We have this collective guilt because we screwed up on the COVID and we locked people down. Um, but um, I think that the Fed, uh, the misreading of the situation, uh, and uh, I'm not going to claim that I had the situation under wraps myself. Uh, I was relying a lot on the Fed research. And the Fed research was showing that historically when you have this, these sort of stimulus checks, the lion's share of it gets saved during a crisis, doesn't get spent. But I guess we didn't adjust for today's uh, me, 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 uh, narcissistic economy that everything's going to get spent. So we had, so not only did we have all these supply chain problems, uh, which is cost push inflation, but we had this massive demand pull inflation at the same time. And I think the Fed, uh, you know, look, who could have predicted uh, what happened with Ukraine, right? Who could have predicted that China? You know, they get three COVID cases or we're going to shut down a, a port city of 20 million people. I mean, we had supply side shocks after supply side shocks. And I'll give the Fed a pass. But I think the faulty um, research was assuming that not much of that stimulus is going to get spent. Uh, and it pretty well all got spent. Uh, and so the Fed, uh, in retrospect, should have been tightening policy earlier, shrinking the balance sheet, raising rates earlier. Um so that was one mistake, and now we're going to correct that mistake with probably another mistake, except I don't know if you would ask the Fed if they're making a mistake. I don't know if they would admit that they're making a mistake, and I say that because why? Because uh, Jay Powell, at his earliest opportunity, when he was trying to rebuild his anti-inflation credentials, compared himself to uh, Paul Volcker. Yeah. He repeatedly compared himself to Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker never apologized for creating a, a recession. In fact, he created two recessions back to back in, uh, in 1980, 81, and then 81, 82 to crush inflation. So I, I don't know. So you have a central banker, Jerome Powell, compares himself to Paul Volcker. Uh, Paul Volcker made no bones about creating a recession to kill inflation. And, um, and there you have Jay Powell comparing himself to Paul Volcker. So I don't think he would ever admit that he's making a mistake if he even said basically, you know, when was it a Jackson Hole? He said he used the word pain. Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to invoke some pain on you to get inflation down. And pain means uh, not that I'm creating new supply chains, but actually I'm going to have to create the conditions for demand destruction. So uh, that's really what the name of the game is. So um, I, I, would they say they made a mistake? I mean, I think that a lot of this could have been avoided. I think that the Fed... The mistake I think they're making uh, is that when they started tightening policy in March 2022, during the Q&A at the press conference, uh, Jay Powell gets up and says that we're, we're going to ignore the supply curve. He says we're going to operate policy with a blind eye towards what's happening uh, in terms of uh, uh, the supply side of the economy. And of course, back then it was once burnt, twice shy. Um, right. But you see... Ever since then, all we've seen is we've seen supply chain pressures uh, dissipate. We've seen the participation rate in the labor market 
especially in the parts that lag behind, uh, especially, um, uh, um, you know, prime working age women, which were slow to come back. Uh, you know, th that's now flirting with an all time high. The participation rates come back and in the right areas. And now you're starting to see this great retirement theme that kept uh, adult males sitting on the couch, you know, uh, you know, playing with their uh, Reddit accounts and thinking that they had a golden goose laid between crypto and the stock market that they could retire early on. Well, that great retirement theme has been retired. So now you're seeing the, uh, the male 50 plus participation rate go up. So the supply side of the economy is coming back and the Fed's telling us, well, we're, we're, we're ignoring it. Uh, well, I think, how do you forecast inflation? How do you forecast prices with one curve? Um, so I think that, you know, for me, if there's the mistake, of course, we all know Monday morning quarterbacking that they acted too late to start tightening. Okay, that's easy. But I think that they have, um, you know, tightening as much as they did. I think all, everything they've done since the fall has been overkill. Uh, I think refusing to sit back and assess the damage they've done, uh, the impact that it's going to have on demand. You see, it's going to be too late. By the time they realize all the damage they've done, the economy is going to be in recession. Inflation is going to be falling like a stone, as it usually does in a recession. By the way, even in the 1970s, the sclerotic unionized 1970s, uh, inflation in the three recessions back then fell substantially. Uh, of course, the problem is that it came back during the recovery phase, but we had a totally different demographic back then. The, the first of the boomers were in their 20s, uh, and so underlying demand was a lot stronger than it is today from the demographic side. Uh, I'm not really that concerned about inflation. Uh, I think that if I'm a central banker in the Fed right now, and I'm seeing the uh, five-year, five-year break-evens and 10-year tips at around 2.3%, to me, uh, there's no sign that they've lost any credibility, but they seem to believe that they've lost credibility. Um, so I, I think that the, we'll look back that, you know, the, and, but this is the cycle. This is what I mean is that, you know, we don't have a central bank run by robots. We have a central bank run by human beings. They make mistakes and they always overstay the accommodation and then they o always over tighten. So, I, I mean, this over easing and over tightening phase, this cycle post COVID is really an over easing and over tightening cycle that's on steroids, but I mean, we haven't seen this before, really, like uh, basically Greenspan takes rates to negative in real terms in 1993. They took the funds rate from nine and seven eights down to 3%, leaves it there for a few years, then oops, then they have to tighten policy. Then they take rates down all the way to uh, 1% back in 2003 after the housing and, and uh, after the dot-com bust. Um, oops, then they got to raise rates. And then next thing you know, uh, they cut rates again. and you know, in 08, 09 to zero, and they expand the balance sheet. Then, oops, again, we got to rate. So we got to raise rates again. They overdo it. And next thing you know, we're back in recession. So is this anything, anything here really surprise anybody? I mean, did the Fed make a mistake? They, they won't admit it. I guess in retrospect, yeah, they made two mistakes. They overeased and that caused them to over tighten. But I'm going to say that you go back to the Fed all the way back in the post World War II period or before. And this is what the business cycle is built off. It's built off of mistakes. Insofar as the central bank is the one controlling interest rates, nothing. There's there's really nothing new here. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On the Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code Margin10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. Yeah, I, w I would tend to agree with you there, Rosie. And, you know, one thing that I have a, a question for you about is where do you think we are in, you know, people, re everyone says, I, I'm, I don't try to read the tea leaves when it comes to the Federal Reserve, but then everyone tries to go and, and read the tea leaves anyway. And there's been an enormous amount of speculation, frankly, even just in the market, if you look at Fed funds futures, it's it's swung around quite a bit in terms of what it thinks the Fed 
is going to do. I think, you know, as of right now, we're recording this on April 25th. There's a moderate, basically the market thinks that we're going to get one more 25 basis point hike in May. Yeah. I'd be very curious, you know, based on what you just said about the Fed making their two policy errors that I agree with you probably surprises absolutely no one. Where do you think we are in this hike, hiking cycle? Do you think we get another tw- 25 basis points, then it's higher for longer? Do you think, are you sort of of the idea as well that we have, we have too much, like, I don't know what you make of the argument that we have too much debt and eventually debt servicing costs go too high. If the, we have these higher sustained rates, where do you sort of think we are in the hiking cycle? Well, I, I do think that the economy is more intersensitive than it's been in the past by virtue of the fact that there is uh, so much debt, uh, not just public sector debt, but private sector debt. You know, I love it when people say to me, oh, the household balance sheet is in such better shape than it was in uh, 07 and 08. And I'm just thinking, really, is that the benchmark you want to use? OK, so household debt to income is not 130%. It's only 100%. It's only the second highest peak that we've ever had. Uh, so but people like to, OK, compared to 08. Compared to 0809, if, 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 if that makes you feel better, household balance sheets are stretched, um, corporate balance sheets are stretched. We know government balance sheets are stretched. We're very intersensitive. That much is true, uh, and that's why interest rates are not going back to uh, you know historically high levels. Although we're pretty well you know at levels right now that we were at on say the the funds rate that we were you know in that last cycle in uh, in the housing crisis back in uh, you know 04, 05, 06. Um, in terms of uh, you know the outlook, the first thing I just want to say is this: uh, the f- the markets are taking on the Fed. Uh, the Fed is saying higher for longer. Uh, the Fed, of course, look the market's priced for May third, twenty five base points because the Fed uh, has has nudged the markets towards that. Uh, again, I, do I think it's a mistake? I, I think it's totally unnecessary uh, that the Fed has to raise rates again. I think it will be the last one of the cycle. I think that if they're data dependent, uh, they're not going to have another opportunity. But the thing is that you got to understand that the Fed is going to pause at some point. And you go back to the history of the Fed pauses. Uh, now, there's times where the Fed doesn't just pause. They actually slice rates to the bone because there's a financial crisis like October 87 or say uh, what happened around long-term capital in, in August of 1998. Um, but uh, normally, after a rate hiking cycle, uh, the Fed presses the pause button and you really, you really have to go back to the minutes and the transcripts to find out what's on their mind. Like what causes them to pause? What causes them to pause? What causes the Fed to pause? Because normally when they pause, it's not a financial calamity. They don't even really see a recession. Uh, I mean, they paused in the summer of 2000. Uh, and they paused in the summer of 2000. Recession started in March of 01. They actually weren't talking about a recession. They just sort of had a, a feeling because the Fed is a risk manager. Uh, they balanced the risks. Uh, and they decided in May of or in the summer of 2000, we don't have any more to go. There were, except for the fact that the Nasdaq had rolled off the highs, nothing else was really happening. Uh, Bernanke went to the sidelines in um, uh, in the summer of 2006. I mean, the recession started more than a year later, uh, and uh, the stock market didn't actually hit its highs until October of 07. The Fed had gone on hold though, because as a group, they say. We want to actually now pause to assess the lags. This Fed hasn't done that yet, but that's all they ever happen. When they when they when we're at the pause in the Fed cycle, it's because they've all collectively agreed, or maybe there'll be a dissent um, that they want to pause. They want to now they want to wait and see. Now look, the Bank Canada has done that for two meetings now, right? The Bank Canada has already done that. The Bank Canada is two meetings ahead of the Fed. So at some point, and I think that, you know, maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe, maybe they got to go to six, 7%, maybe Mohammed Alarian or any, everybody else out there who's so hawkish on rates. I, I don't think so. At some point they got to pause. There's always been a pause. I think it would be rational for them to pause. I, in fact, I don't think they got to hike rates at the next meeting, but they always go overboard. As I said before, it's just the nature of the institution. They always go overboard, but they do pause. And I think the pause will come. Now the pause comes, every pause comes with a de facto tightening bias. There's never been a pause that says, oh, guess what? We're pausing and we're going to cut rates. No, 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 no. That happens later. Several months down the road after the pause, they'll say, okay, guess what? We're changing our outlook and our next move is going to be to cut rates. 
Okay. Uh, even Powell did that, by the way, in 2019, if you remember. Uh, and it's debatable as to whether or not we would have had a recession without the pandemic. But the yield curve, as we talked about earlier, if the yield curve did invert uh, in August and September briefly in 2019, but they will pause. Remember, he even paused the last rate hike, December 2018. First rate cut is, um, I think, August 2019. So there's there's mm. a lag, lag, six to eight month lag. So they're going to pause. They're going to bark because they don't want the markets to think that they're going to cut rates. They don't want, you see, they don't want the markets to price in what is priced in. They don't want that. Uh, they don't want the stock market to go haywire and go back to the highs. And as a group, they're still a little nervous that maybe inflation is going to be sticky. So the pause is going to be with a hawkish directive, okay, until they move to an easing directive. They'll be signaling rate cuts. The market will price in more rate cuts, and then they'll be cutting interest rates. Uh, and that's just the cycle at play. And that's the history of the Fed. They are a slow-moving, incremental institution. But that's normally uh, the reaction function that they have. So as far as the, you know, the markets are playing a game of chicken with the Fed, is that the first time that we've seen this? I mean, with all due respect, we saw this in reverse, you know, back in uh, early 2022. Uh, the yield curve was steepening. Uh, oh, by the way, nobody was complaining about that. Nobody said fade the yield curve. Did I mention that already? No, nobody mentioned about the yield curve. It was steepening. Uh, and, uh, and what do you really think about the yield curve, David? It's hard, hard uh, to get. It's, a, it's, more, it's more. It's more about the people that say dismiss something that's got a near perfect track record. It's just mm. just to justify their own bullish bias mm. or the masters they work for. Uh, because they have to push product for a living. Yeah. But you see, before the Fed started raising rates, the market was pricing in rate hikes. At the time when Powell was saying lower for longer, not, not, not higher for lower. People tend to forget lower for longer, lower for longer, lower for longer. People tend to forget that was the Fed's mantra just a couple of years ago. Uh, the market's already saying, no, Mr. and Mrs. Fed, you're wrong. You're going to have to raise rates. Okay, so yeah, the market was playing a game of chicken uh, with the Fed then and doing it in the mirror image today. Now, as far as the Fed's concerned, and I, I should not be, I'm in no position to be in the glass house throwing stones, but I'm going to do it anyways. They, the Fed unveils <clears throat> its two, 2023 dot plots for the funds rate in the summer of 2021, June of 2021. They unveil their first median dot plots and all the dot plots for the end of this year. Where were they? Where were they? 0.625%. They were five, five eights. So you'd be saying, well, that's why. Look, a lot, anybody who's in the mortgage market, the housing market, look at these banks. Look at Silicon Valley Bank, was they're saying, well, they're never going to raise rates. So we've got all these treasuries and these hold and maturity accounts. Um, oops, next thing you know, we're in a, the biggest rate cycle. So like, how do you do, how do you get, seriously, how do you get to our median dot plot? This isn't 10 years ago. This is basically the summer of 2021. Yeah. How do you go from five eighths of a percent is our call for the end of 2020 for the funds rate. And next thing you know, it's like Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football that then we go through the most, uh, acute, Fed tightening cycles since 1981. How do you go to the two extremes? It's not like the Fed went to two. It's not like the Fed went to three. They're going to five plus. And they told us in the summer of 2021, less than two years ago, that we're going to finish this year at 0.625%. So you're going to say to me, well, the temerity of the markets to take on the Fed. If anything, I don't think there's enough rate cuts priced in for next year. Because I think there's a serious risk. We're going back down to the zero bound. Any recession that ends up destroying demand and creating the conditions for a substantial demand-driven decline in inflation. So, David, could could you? So, you mentioned next year. Could you lay out sort of a timeline? And when you when you when you talk about recession, I think a lot of people have different mental images for what that might look like because there have been many different types of recessions in you know over the last. The last century in the U.S. So, when you talk about a recession, I know you are definitely not in the the no landing or not even necessarily the soft landing 
camp. But walk us through a little bit more concretely what your hard landing scenario looks like. And then when does the Fed eventually, we know eventually maybe they've got one, max, two more rate hikes in them and they're going to hold rate, they're going to pause for a period of time. But what is the timing on the pivot? Well, firstly, you're quite right. Look, the, the recession, if we're going to do a medical diagnosis, just means the economy is sick. Mm. But it's, it's not permanent. I, I mean, mm. there, there is nothing that's permanent. I uh, have to make the point here that 85% of the time, the economy is in an expansion. 85% of the time, we are in a bull market. 15% of the time, we're in a recession. And 15% of the time, we're in a bear market. And that's where we are right now. So... Uh, it's just a, uh, it's like the, it's like the economy gets a flu bug. Okay. It's, it's not the end of the world. Okay. Nobody's going to die. I, I can't believe how many people resist this. It's like, it's like you talk about a recession of most people. I, I'm debating these other economists on wall street. It's, it's like, I, I we're having a debate. It's, it, it's honest to God. It's like, I, I, it's like I said to them, your kid is ugly. That's the response. I mean, we're just talking about the natural evolution of the cycle. Why, why fight it? Why fight mother nature? Are you going to tell me? Are you going to tell me that after spring, we don't get summer? That's not going to happen. No. After summer, we're not going to get fall. No, 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 no. Uh, the yield curve. The yield curve. You know, I'm not going to get. Give me a break. It's just it's just the cycle. And it's because interest rates and a credit-driven economy matter. Um, look, we have a lot of complications, right? We, we've never had a Fed tightening cycle, by the way, of any size mm -hmm. that didn't create a uh, financial crisis. Uh, even once they don't have a recession, we could talk about the repo market blowing up in the Fed's own backyard in 2019. Uh, we can talk about, uh, you know, there was a soft landing in 1995, but there was no soft landing in Mexico and Orange County, right? Uh, there was actually in 1987, GDP growth was 5%, and here we had the stock market collapse. Um, Connell, Illinois in 1984. Uh, we can go on. The savings and loan crisis of 1989 90. Uh, so you're always looking at, you know, where where's the excess? Where, where, where it, it usually surprises you, right? Uh, now everybody's talking about commercial real estate. Uh, we're talking about uh, regional banks. Um, we have to wait after the Fed raises rates, and especially once they invert the yield curve, you have to wait. Where is the financial crunch going to come? And as you said, it came well. Well, three banks failed in short order, and um, and so what's going to happen next is the magnitude and duration of the of the of the credit contraction uh because there's only one thing we know uh we know that the government and the fed together the regulators moved aggressively to backstop the situation and uh ensured that we didn't have financial contagion and uh they did a very good job at that this is not a way to row nine it's just something totally different um but everything that we're seeing is telling us that the banks who are already becoming a lot more cautious with their lending behavior and raising loan loss provisioning. And we know that the first quarter Fed loan offers a survey uh, had tightened to levels that we've only seen in the recession. That was actually before Silicon Valley Bank failed. So now we're in a different situation where banks, and especially the regional banks, which uh, took up a much larger share of the credit buy, pie because uh, I mean they were not as regulated or monitored or supervised as the big banks who were in the penalty box for so much of the last cycle coming out of the crisis. Um, so the small banks aren't small anymore. They've taken up a record share of outstanding credit in the U.S. economy. They're going to be rather circumspect. Uh, and it's not just because of deposit outflows, but also because of how they're going to approach their capital and how they're going to approach their balance sheet. Uh, and so what it means is that they will be lending ongoingly to the best credit worthy borrowers, but that's not what causes the recession. The recession is always at the margin. And if you're not a credit worthy borrower to the highest degree, you're going to have trouble accessing credit. And remember, change is always at the margin. You know, uh, I, when I talked before about the recession as a haircut, the GDP recessions aren't like the stock market. It's not like, you know, you think the stock market down 30%. GDP is not going down 30%. Uh, a recession could be like a 1% decline in the economy. Okay, that's a recession. Uh, the unemployment rate goes from three and a half, say, to six percent. That would be a recession. You'd say six percent, not a big deal, but it's the change. Yeah, mm -hmm. you could say, hey, at the recession, ninety-four percent of the workforce is employed. Yes, exactly. But you see what happens because that's why, you know, economics is a social science, is a soft science, but it's really a science of behavior, uh, consumer behavior. 
So when you start to see your friend across the street lose his job or your cousin lose his job or somebody that you know gets their hours cut by half, uh, psychologically, you start to rein in your own spending behavior. Uh, you might take the family out to the restaurant one last time a week or a month, but it has a cascading effect on the economy. So it comes down to confidence at the same time. So we have layered on top of the lagged impact of all the rate increases and the impact that has on the housing market, the impact that has on debt servicing capacity. Um, now we have uh, not just the cost of credit, which is still a problem for the economy that hasn't gone away, but now the availability of credit is going to compound that. So it's very difficult right now to gauge how deep this is likely to be. You see, because normally the Fed would be cutting rates. Normally, the Fed would be cutting rates. The only Fed that raised rates into a financial crisis, oh, guess who it was? Guess who? Paul Volcker in 1984. Uh, he raised rates into continental Illinois' demise, uh, but then he quickly cut rates 150 basis points thereafter. Um, this Fed, you know, continued to raise rates into an inverted yield curve. Uh, it has this belief, at least stated belief, the economy is strong. I'm not so sure. It, it continues to talk about a red-hot labor market. All you hear from Jay Powell is uh, str how strong, strong. Uh, we just heard very, 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 very strong labor market from James Bullard. Very, very. Not just very strong. Not just strong. Very, very strong. But labor market's always the last man standing in the cycle. Again, you have a Fed. It comes down to your question before about mistakes. How are we going to view a Fed that focuses exclusively on lagging and contem con contemporaneous indicators? Why? Why is it? You know, I, I saw, you know, I saw Sarah Eisen uh, on CNBC today interviewing um, some senior official at the NBER. She says, do you mean to tell me that we could have a three and a half percent on a play rate still have a recession? Yes, that's happened multiple times in the past. Uh, the mm -hmm. unemployment rate is always at the cycle low. And actually, it continues to go down into the recession, mm -hmm. just as the unemployment rate tends to go up once the recession is over. When you're, if you're focused on the unemployment rate, you're looking at it heading into the recession, thinking, where's the recession? But the recession's here. It's a lagging indicator. Just as you're wondering, as it's still rising into the opening months of the recovery, you're saying, oh, my God, this recession is never going to end, but it's already ended. So I'm saying that the Fed is, is looking in all the wrong places. And uh, that's that's a source of frustration. You ask me about the mistake. Really, it's it's not driving the car and looking through the front window. They're focused on lagging indicators, which is uh, a little weird, but maybe... Maybe surreptitiously, we'll look at the Fed transcripts five years from now and we'll say, oh, it wasn't actually Volcker after all. It was McChesney Martin. They just want to take the punch bowl away. They wanted to, mm. they wanted to destroy this unhealthy uh, extended link between the financial economy and the real economy, Wall Street and Main Street. Maybe all along it was about to redress financial asset inflation as opposed to just classic consumer inflation. I mean, who knows? The truth comes out really when you read the transcripts. Uh, not the minutes and not what he says when he gets up there as a politician in front of the camera, but what really happens at the meeting. Um, so, you know, we'll find out. But I, I tend to find that this Fed, this version of the Fed has been amongst the most interesting, uh, I would say frustrating uh, and also confusing Federal Reserves uh, that I've come across in my 40 years in the business. And what do you attribute that to out of curiosity? Uh, you know, this is going to sound, um, a little petty, but I'm going to say it anyways. Why not? So when Jay Powell got appointed, uh, and then confirmed as Fed chairman in early 2018, uh, and now, uh, you know, everybody was saying to me back then, thank God we got an economist out there. Uh, out of the, we don't need an economist running the Fed. They've only screwed things up. Get the economists out of there. Uh, and so to which I said, well, uh, I mean, is having a lawyer heading up the Fed any better? So, you know, it's, it's the old joke about uh, what do you call an economist and a lawyer at the bottom of the ocean? And uh, the answer is uh, a good start. A good start. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, I, 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 I look at I, I don't know. I'll tell you that I think that we talked about this before. You know, we talked about the dot plots. Too much transparency. Way too much. We, 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 the, the, and this started with Bernanke. He swung the pendulum. The Fed used to be true, a closed book under Volcker, you know, shrouded in secrecy. I think Greenspan struck the right balance. It was Greenspan that first started with the uh, post-meeting um, uh, press statements. 
but there's no getting in front of the camera. Yeah, the only time you saw Greenspan really, unless he gave a really big speech, was that what we used to call the Humphrey Hawkins testimonies in front of Congress. Hmm. I mean, back back in the day when I started in the day in the in the eighties uh, and into the nineties, if, if anybody, it could be whoever the equivalent, probably Meltzer uh, from the St. Louis Fed. If a Fed, if a Fed uh, regional bank president or a governor gave a speech back when I started in the business and I was cutting my teeth, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. It didn't even matter if it was from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of uh, of Minneapolis or Richmond. It was a big deal. Today, there's like four or five of them a day. Four or five of them a day. You know, maybe you interview them. I don't know. They're on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, Fox mm. TV. Uh, and send some more than others. And um, and then you have all these former Fed officials that are second-guessing the Fed all the time uh, on TV. I've never seen this before. Uh, I know I'm not saying... I'm not saying uh, somebody was honking me to uh, to uh, stop uh, running the red running the red lights there. So... Uh, <laughs> No, go go yeah. go ahead. I no, so, uh, no. I was I was just uh, you know I was just going to say that it's a it's a different Fed. It's a um, I guess the problem is that they become a bunch of rock stars, and, and there's not a there's not a TV camera they won't basically run in front of, and not even to say anything intelligent, um, but to uh, talk about how they're, they're going to cast their vote at the next meeting. You know, when I first started on the business, I remember the two first, I went to go here um, at the Empire Club in Toronto and then the Canada Club. I heard uh, Lee Hoskins, who was from the Cleveland Fed. And at that point, we were uh, just signing on or negotiating the free trade agreement with the United States. And all he talked about was how free trade, how it was going to impact uh, the Great Lake economies. You know, here I am like 40 years later remembering that speech. And about a week later, I heard um, uh, 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 Corrigan, uh, who was head of the New York Fed, um, give a speech on the Big Bang. Uh, because at that point, uh, we were seeing all the deregulation globally in the financial industry and the impact that was going to have on the capital markets. I remember that like yesterday. Uh, mm. Corrigan and Hoskins weren't talking about, you know, I, we got massive inflation and we got, you know, and uh, I, we got to raise rates. You know, they kept that to the committee. I, I find that these Fed officials, but no one seems to mind. No one seems to mind that they continuously cast their vote at uh, in front of the TV cameras or in the uh, radio stations. It's it's crazy that they're, they, they continuously have to feel the need to nudge the markets in one direction. Um, I think it's actually unhealthy. I, I'd rather hear less from the Fed. Uh, I think there's going to be a happy medium. This all started under Bernanke, okay? Yeah. Uh, and it's just gone wild. The, the 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 number of Fed speak that we can have sometimes in a day. I mean, I just say to myself, don't these people work for a living? Like, I mean, really? <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's a it's a real distraction. Um, so. I don't know. It's a uh, and and then, and then I'll tell you the truth. And I don't mean to cast aspersions, although I guess it's going to come across that way. I would I would challenge anybody and look to show you what I do for fun. I go back. I I read vociferously, but there there might not be there might not be a speech uh, or a testimony that the Fed chairman of the past forty years have given that I didn't read. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same goes for the FOMC transcripts, uh, which I know. I mean, this is what I do for fun when I'm on the tarmac. But they they read like a like a Greek tragedy uh, or a Shakespearean play, and that, in fact, they're very interesting. I'll tell you this much: you go back and you so uh, I, 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 this is a great exercise. You're, you're going to get a view, and, and frankly, I don't care what people think about Alan Greenspan. We know that he was tainted uh, by the bubble bursting. He wasn't on top of it. His lib his uh, his um, libertarian views, uh, free market views, got you know way way ahead uh, of his judgment. We know how that played out, but the guy was absolutely brilliant, and, and he still is brilliant. You read the stuff that he that he talked about, his speeches and testimonies uh, about the markets and the pricing of markets and the economy and the intricacies. There was no fluff. I'll tell you this much about Alan Greenspan, uh, who I have a lot of respect for. Flaws and all, we're all flawed. 
the, the level of brilliance was unparalleled. By the way, I, I would say the same thing. Uh, I, I will, I'll compare Volcker to, to Greenspan. There might not have been a more brilliant Fed chairman at, th- th- than Greenspan. And when you go and you read the transcripts, because at the end, he gives he, 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 he brings it all together at the end, all, all the Fed chairmen do. And you read what he says in the transcripts. These, these are masterpieces. His knowledge of the economy and his knowledge of financial markets. As far as uh, titans of central banking, uh, unparalleled. And I don't think that exists today. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you all for listening to On The Margin. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up about a conference that we have coming up in the new year called Permissionless. I'm sure most of you have been there last year. Uh, It is the cultural event of the year. We had over 5,500 people down in Palm Beach. This year, we are moving to Austin, Texas. You know what they say about Texas? Everything's bigger in Texas. (laughs) Uh, so last year, we had a really great lineup of speakers. We had the two co-founders of Robinhood, Vlad Tenev and Baiju Bot. We had Chris Dixon. We had some of the folks that have been on the show a whole bunch of times, Jim Bianco, Dan Tapiero. Just a phenomenal lineup of speakers, and you can expect the same this year. If you use Margin 10, you'll get 10% off on a ticket. Again, that's Margin 10, because I love you guys so much. Click the link at the bottom of the show notes. Hope to see you there in person. I, so I have a, I don't want to get too far because I want to end this interview by asking you, you know, what your thoughts are on, on how assets are going to respond to all of these, these economic gyrations that we've been talking about. But, I, you know, I have to ask you this, this perennial question that I, I, that I sort of have and, you know, which is, you know, you listen to a lot of these sorts of podcasts or, or interviews and, you know, people talk about the Fed as if, don't they understand what they're doing? You know, these, and some people go so far as to say these, these, you know, idiots, you know, making bad decisions in the Federal Reserve. You know, Jay Powell, at some period of time, for you know, relatively recently before he took up his post as chairman of the Federal Reserve, talked about a bubble that was being blown in long duration fixed income securities. And then he gets into the the post of chairman and he acts the way that he's acted and has con- kind of continued to blow that bubble, which tells me that he was certainly aware of the situation before he took the post. But, you know, my assumption would be some bit of information that maybe you or I don't have access to or a consideration that you and I might not weigh, saying that he does, has sort of made him change his mind. And what I'm getting at here is, you know, what, is it, it's very easy to, to Monday morning kind of quarterback and say, yeah, they, you know, they, they waited too long to raise rates and now they're making a policy error. Are you in the camp of generally, I think that, the, the Fed as an institution does a pretty good job? Or are you in the camp of, I just, I just can't wrap my mind around what they're doing? Well, look, they're, 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 they're not idiots. That's for sure. I, I mean, they are, they are brilliant. Um, I, I, I just find them to be at this stage of, uh, very confusing. They, they continue to change the goalposts. Mm. They continue to change what they're looking at. Uh, I don't really understand why they're looking at, what they're looking at. Why? Why are you looking at job openings to unemployment? Why are you looking at such a soft number, jolts job openings, especially post-COVID? There's mul- it's, there's so much double counting. And the response rate is like 30%. Why are you basing policy off such a spurious statistic? Uh, so I was stunned that that was Powell's favorite statistic, you know, when they came out with this new super duper core core, uh, you know, um, X shelter, X energy uh, service sector inflation, uh, I get I get what they're doing. They they sort of this is what they believe they want to focus on that because that's um, the you know, that's uh, what's it what's in there recreation services, leisure, hospitality, restaurants, bars, hotels, airlines health, education, all the areas that they're most concerned about where there's a labor demand mismatch and their big concern. So looking at that price variable, that's the inflation they're looking at because their big concern is that we're going to get burgeoning wage pressures there. It's going to filter into inflation that's going to broaden out to the rest of the economy, to which I'm there saying, like, please, you're focused, really, you're focused policy on 20% of the CPI, 20% of the CPI. And there's the other 80% that, that don't matter. So uh, I don't quite, un- I, I mean, I don't quite understand. They continue to shift the goalposts. All mm-hmm. along, they've been trying to find different ways to uh, justify the most hawkish posture since 1981, even though this is not 1981. 
So uh, I think part of it is that, you know, you got Powell, second term, and he's being compared to Arthur Burns. Uh, and Arthur Burns gets a bit of a bad rap, but it's like, uh, you know, you're being compared to, um, uh, you know, the worst central banker who ever lived. So who wants that on their dossier? Mm. So uh, you're going to retire as Burns or retire as Volcker. So I will just retire as Volcker because Volcker is so revered. He is the gold standard of central banking. That's what people believe anyways. Uh, and so that's the route that he's going. So I think that there's a very high degree of hubris that's going on here. And he's managed, amazingly enough, no dissents. Now, we'll see what happens May 3rd. No dissents. Everybody is lined up behind the chairman, which is rather incredible. Um, and uh, so I think that this uh, Fed has me uh, a little miffed because they continue to change the things that they're looking at, almost deliberately looking at things that justify their policy stance. There's as many other things right now that would have caused them to go on hold even before the Bank of Canada went on hold, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. What's the Bank of Canada seeing that the Fed's not seeing, right? Yeah, I, I agree. It does also feel like, from my perspective, there's been some some moving of the goalposts. And it is a little bit, you know, for all the transparency that they're, that they're clearly striving for, it has been a little bit confusing as to why they're doing what they're doing. That's for sure. Now, David, I, I want to close and in, in sort of get you to dust your, dust your uh, crystal ball off and talk to us about what do you think Let's let's say stock. So the S and P here is I think it's up about eight percent on the year. It's at forty one hundred now. I mean, you know, when we talk about a recession and potentially a hard landing, you know, it it doesn't always map one one to one economic activity and asset prices. So how do you think this economic recession that we've been talking about for this whole interview here is going to map onto let's say stocks and bonds? Well, look, uh, true what you say, we're up eight percent, and yet almost all that eight percent has come from ten stocks. Yeah. Uh, and they're the 10 mega caps uh, that will drive a cap weighted index like the S&P 500. If you do the, the chart of the financials or the small banks or the regional banks, you'd be wondering where, where, where exactly is this bull market this year? Uh, look, the, the, best, the best days and weeks for the stock market historically happen in bear markets. Nothing moves in a straight line. Um, and I think that uh, if you wanted to say fundamentally, what's the market? been doing and you could also say it's not just the equity market but say the credit market well they've gone into price in the soft landing yeah. they priced out the recession and in fact we wrote a whole report about this looking at different asset classes and sectors to see what is actually and so all of a sudden a recession right now in the marketplace broadly speaking is a flip of a coin um i, I don't think there's a get out of jail free card after the tightening cycle we've just endured um that's you know it's just a matter of timing so in terms of the answer to the question, um, yeah, I'm, I'm bearish on equities as an asset class. Uh, understanding that, you know, there, a lot of the stock market today is like, you know, uh, you call it defensive growth if you want. Some of these are very expensive PE multiples, but the market's so much different. It's so much more concentrated now. Um, but I am bearish on equities as an asset class. I don't like the valuations. I mean, we're pressing against a 19 Ford multiple. Uh, so what does that get you? Like 5.3% uh, as an earnings yield, I can pick up 5.4 uh, in the, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in, in uh, single A, triple B uh, corporate credit, uh, line up in a better part of the capital structure. So uh, I don't like, uh, I don't, I don't like the valuations. Uh, I don't think a recession is fully priced in. Uh, so the equity market right now is, uh, and I probably, per, in my pers personally, I have the lowest weighting of equities in my portfolio I've had since 2007, uh, just wow. for full disclosure. So, uh, but I have, I have like, you know, I have uh, long short strategies uh, and uh, I have bonds and I have gold and I have some alternatives. Um, but I, I, I'm as, trying to be as non-correlated with, uh, call it GDP as possible. I think that, the way I see it is this. It just comes down to what makes sense. Uh, let, and let's be rational people here. Uh, and this is a case where your assumptions drive your conclusions. My assumption is we're going to go into recession. Uh, my assumption is that you go into recession, you get a classic 20% hit to earnings in a recession, and we're coming along that way. But in a recession, the multiple doesn't bottom at 19. The bottom, say, at 15, 16. So that takes you, if you do the arithmetic, because all the S&P 500 is any moment of time is a product of two numbers, earnings and the multiple. Mm. 
takes me down somewhere close to 3,300. So I think there's another 20% down from here, at least. And no, it's not the end of the world. It's not, it's just, it's just the markets. It'll be painful if you're long, but if you have the dry powder and the liquidity, you'll be able to pick up assets at better levels as you always do in a recession. That's the beauty of recessions is that they cleanse and they move assets from weak hands to strong hands. So having liquidity on hand, and I also have a lot of cash because uh, I'm for optionality purposes, plus you're getting paid four or 5% to be in cash. So why not? Um, the market will bottom at some point. Now, don't forget, I know you said we're up 8% for the year, but we're still in month 16 of the bear market that started in mm -hmm. January of 2022. That hasn't changed. And it's mm -hmm. not gonna be a straight line. It's a game of snakes and ladders, but we are still in a fundamental bear market. Uh, when do fundamental recession bear markets end? Uh, they end when the recession is 70% of the way through. This one's just starting. If I'm wrong, it's that it starts with the third quarter or the second quarter, but it's not like the recession is almost over. You typically buy the market when the recession is almost over, basically in the sixth or seventh inning, because the market will see the whites of the eyes of the recovery, just as the market typically sees the whites of the eyes of the recession. But what is needed are two things. The Fed has to cut rates. The Fed has to cut rates aggressively because there's no evidence anywhere, anytime, not just that we don't bottom at a 19 forward multiple, mm -hmm. but you don't bottom with an inverted yield curve and the Fed's still tightening. I mean, that's unheard of. I'm not willing to say to people, oh, well, it's different this time. Go in and, and extend your risk, your risk profile. No, no, no. Uh, when the Fed cuts rates sufficiently to re-steepen the yield curve to a more normal slope, we want to get back to something normal. You want to go up, you want to get back to a normal equity market, then we have to normalize the yield curve. And at the lows, historically, people say that nobody rings the alarm bell. But I'll tell you, uh, when the Fed has eased policy enough that it steepens the twos tens uh, to plus 140 basis points, that's a very bullish sign. I might not, I might not even wait for that to happen. If I see that it's going to happen, that'll cause me to be a lot more constructive on the market outlook. That might be next year's story. On top of that, let's do the simple math of risk for reward bonds versus stocks, the equity risk premium which is now less than 200 basis points at the fundamental bear market lows. And again, we have to put our historian hat on because we are playing the probabilities. Mm. Uh, the ERP is normally over 400 basis points at the lows. We're at less than half that right now. So dial me up, call it 3,200 on the S&P, 2.5% on the 10-year note, and, uh, and I'll do the flip. But you see, the thing is that if you're going to turn bullish on stocks, you first have to turn bullish on bonds. Lower bond yields have to provide the thrust, the mother's milk, for the relative valuation improvement that equities are going to need at the lows. And this is exactly, for example, what happened back in the lows in the summer of 1982, yeah. is that bond yields went down first, and they always do this. Bond yields go down first. Look what happened. Going, let's go to the last cycle, 2009. Bond yields went down first. They actually bottomed in December 2008. And then equity of bottoms March, in, March of 2009. Uh, and so bond yields going down will lead the equity markets to the bottom. So it's it's basically what comes first, the chicken or the egg. So I would say the people on the line that if you're going to want to turn bullish on stocks, uh, you first have to turn bullish on bonds. Bond yields will get to stupid low levels. And when they do, and the ERP is 400 basis points, and the two's tens curve is 140 basis points, I'm going to tell you something right here right now just for your viewers which is that at that point i will turn into rosenberg the perma bull <laughs> man i can't wait to say that david <laughs> that'll be a fun day um david you've been super generous with your time and as listeners know from listening to you during this episode or previous episodes or on the margin or a whole bunch of other interviews that you've done over the years your views are super super valuable if people want to find out more about your work subscribe subscribe to the good work that you do what's the best way for them to do that right well you know thanks for the um for the 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 opportunity to give a little bit of a pitch uh we produce uh 12 different products uh and, and all geared towards uh how to make money and save money in the marketplace and we're small picture and we're big picture and everything in between uh so if you go on the rosenberg research website just google rosenberg research it'll take you there or you can go to information information at rosenbergresearch.com or email, email me directly, drosenberg at rosenbergresearch.com. Uh, any one of these things takes you to the website, and uh, you can see everything that we do right on there, including some samples. Like I say, uh, we do uh, 12 different products, a uh, couple of dailies, 
couple of weeklies, uh, monthlies. Uh, we do webcasts. Um, and you could buy our premium package or you could just buy single products. It's all there. Uh, what I think everybody should know is that we give, we'll give everybody on this call a free one month trial uh, for our research. Free one month. So, so you can uh, kick our tires and taste our wares uh, so, you know, simultaneously and then make an educated decision as to whether or not uh, you want to come into the fold. Uh, so uh, anybody on the call, uh, please take advantage of that. Absolutely. Guys, I would uh, highly recommend that you do. David, it's always a pleasure when we get to chat and catch up. I have to do it again sometime soon. I hope so. Take care and thanks again. Mm -hmm.